Hello, everyone. Um, I believe we are now underway. Please join me in welcoming Edelman's um, Global Executive Director of IP, Ponya Rees, to the Minister of Policy. Nice to be here. Thank you, Paul. Um, Tony's had a remarkable career in marketing, strategy, events, media, but today we're one to zero in very specifically on a huge piece of IP she's been responsible for this year, uh, namely the Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, this year, I personally was floored by the low levels of trust in societal institutions, particularly media, NGOs, and politicians and government that came out from the uh, results, and I feel like they many of our users use, use our tools to understand issues and movements in society and we get a whole other perspective on, on what's going on with those through through this kind of um, quantitative and um, very powerful research covering so many um, countries as well. So we're going to bring in some of the key slides and dig into the findings. Uh, so we're ready, Tony, to take it away. Let's let's go. Okay. So is this let's talk data. Talk? Let's talk data. I was just having a little fun because this is, I haven't done a PowerPoint thing in a while and I had a little trouble just a moment ago. So we're going to um, just share my screen. I, I think this is going to work out. And I think we're there and sharing our screen. We Very can cool. see it. Thank you, Paul. You can see it, super. Um, so, uh, let's jump right in. Uh, there's so much interesting stuff to talk about, and we'd invite our guests to post any questions into the channel. Um, Danielle, our producer, will direct them my way, and uh, we, we'll try and reserve some time at the end for those. Um, so I think the, the first step is to put the trust barometer into context a little bit, Tonya. You know, this year it's declaring information bankruptcy. What does that mean? And is that a break or a continuation of existing trends? Well, the idea behind a bankruptcy is that you get a chance to start over, right? So we're hoping that uh, this year's report signals a break. Um, as you can see from the slide, we've been studying trust for 21 years. And, you know, while there are some longer term themes that we've been paying attention to over the years. So, for instance, you know, as early as 2005, we noted that shift in trust from authority figures to people like myself. Right? That was very much a part of the rise of social media as not just an information source, as a way of people to connect with each other. But then as, we, as that started to create shifts in essentially the power structure right, and the hierarchy of trust, um, we arrived in 2015 um, at a very stunning finding which is the first time uh, that we then looked at the concerns and rising concerns about fake news. And at the time, two or three years ago, we really were thinking about it more as a, um, in a sense of a foreign threat, right? The question we asked is how worried are you about fake news being used as a weapon against your country? So quite aggressive and something like three quarters of the population globally. This is a global study. We this year surveyed people in 28 countries. Um, so there were very, very high levels of concerns. But what we've seen since then is a continued erosion of um, we don't know who to trust. We don't know what to believe. We don't know where to turn for reliable information, even if we're out there trying to sort things out on our own. Um, and so um, things have gotten to such a state that this is not just a foreign threat, but people even perceive it to be a domestic, that there are bad actors domestically that are deliberately sowing misinformation um, into the system. So we think it is critical to really shine a light on that and ask um, all institutions to, you know, take a step back and think about how we're going to get back to a shared sense of truth and reality. And does declaring bankruptcy usually involves saying, okay, what we've got doesn't work. Is that the implication here? Yeah, it really is. Um, it's a strong word. I know it has slightly different implications in different countries and, uh, and so on, but, but yeah, the system right now is broken. Media is the least trusted. Um, all news sources this year have seen, you know, a steep decline. Historically, 
um, there's been a little bit of a seesaw where there are some years that people say, you know, wow, you know, I'm much more likely to trust my neighbor down the street for information on something. And then there's mm -hmm. a bit of a backlash as people see the impact of misinformation in the system or the, you know, pollution of the information system. Um, and then they turn back to experts, right, and, and authority figures. But this year, trust in both experts and peers has gone down. Trust in both traditional and social media has gone down. So mm -hmm. it's time for a reset. Well, let's look at some of the, the metrics that are driving you towards that kind of conclusion and that summary, Tonya. Well, um, can you describe what we're looking at here around trust declines across all institutions? Um, yeah, sure. This, so this is US data, right? Um, we have a global report that you can see online how this plays out across the different countries. Uh, but the story in the US is pretty grim this year. Um, you can see that in May of this year of, of 2020, we actually went back out in the field. It was an unusual year, obviously, with the pandemic. And we wanted to see how much of an impact did the um, onset of the pandemic have on trust in institutions. Um, and you can see what we found mid-year is a surge in trust, right? Mm -hmm. People needed help, knew we had a big national crisis, a global crisis, and said, we really are going to need our institutions to step up. And so they really turned to, you could see a big increase for government, for business, for NGOs, and it was almost a, a cry for help. Um, and we ended that report with a big question mark, you know, is this a real rise in trust, an opportunity for institutions to step up and do more, or are we going to see, you know, or is it a trust bubble, essentially? Um, and you can see across all four institutions, that increased trust was followed by a decline. Uh, in the case of media, the decline was even steeper than the rise, right? So big disappointments there in the fall, NGOs lost all of its increase. Um, mm -hmm. government came down six, so ended the year up a little bit at the end of the year, but, you know, 42 is still a very low number. Um, yeah. the, the least amount of volatility, interestingly, was for business, right? And so the net change from January to January in the U.S. is business is up three or four points and is the most trusted institution in the U.S. That's true globally as well although globally the numbers are a bit higher. The U.S. is near the bottom of the ranking if you were to look at this data across all 28 countries. As a, as a kind of a parallel to this, back in um, about May, we, we coordinate with the University of Michigan, something called the IFI quotient. Um, it's really, this would be their IP, where they use our data, which shows which stories are getting engagement and which sources to look at which... Um, you know, are, are, are trusted sources getting more engagement or less trusted and more partisan sources? And we saw a spike in engagement with trusted sources early in the pandemic, both on Facebook and on Twitter. And it seemed to remain the case on Facebook. Uh, what I haven't, we haven't done with the team there is look at that data for the rest of the year, but I kind of suspect that we may see a similar pattern. People thought to trusted sources and there was maybe been a burst in general social trust and um, and trust in institutions already in the pandemic, but that passed. I would love to see that when you have that analysis. Great, we'll share it, we'll share it. So let's let's drill in on, on um, actually, because we're going to run out of time, this is an awesome slide, but let's jump ahead to the sure. business, uh, this, this slide here. Um, and by the way, I'd, the, the full report that we're going through can all be downloaded um, directly from Edelman. If you just look up the, the Edelman Trust Barometer, you'll find all of this and, and plenty more. Um, but we focus in on business just now as a, as a place where um, there seem to be higher trust than the other institutions. Can you explain what we're looking at on this graph, please, Tonya? Yeah, what, what our research shows is that, you know, there are multiple dimensions to trust and they can be summarized really in this graphic as, do you trust this institution or person or individual to be competent, right? To have the ability to get things done. And do you trust them to do things with integrity, right? With uh, a purpose and consideration and, and broader considerations than their own self-interest in a way where the benefits are fairly distributed across stakeholders. Right, and so that's that ethical dimension is a little bit more complicated than what we're summarizing it here. 
Um, but that's essentially what it comes down to, right? And even our simple trust question is, do you trust this institution or person to do what is right, right? So it has both the competence and the ethics um, implied in that question. What we see on the chart is that for the first time, right? We've only been doing this analysis for a couple of years now, but um, for the first time we see that business is now perceived as being not just the only institution that is competent, but also um, is eth seen as ethical, just above the line, right? NGOs also are seen as ethical, but they're not seen as having the ability to get much done. Uh, mm -hmm. Government and media are neither competent or ethical, and there's just a massive gap there. And I think really one of the challenges, one of the structural challenges right now between competence for government and business, because much as we like to tell business that you have a big obligation to take on some big challenges, um, certainly you can't do it alone, right? And we need government to sort of get its act together in order to be a good, effective partner. Yeah, and learn from what business is doing right. I think that would be a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> Um, I, I, I jumped past the, the Biden Trump side, but I'm realizing some other things that we're going to talk about may not make sense if we don't spend a moment here and look at how much the trust index is different among Trump v. Biden voters. Some yeah, we see differences and divides in the trust data in a number of different ways, you know, and one of them, of course, in the U.S. is this deep polarization across political divides. We fielded a survey that was sort of a post trust barometer flash poll because our main data was in the field right around the US election. So we wanted to see what was the impact of the election results on the trust findings. And so we did another quick flash poll in December about a month after the election. And this shows the change from the November original fielding, the main field date to that December flash poll. And you can see um, there was a big decline, not surprisingly, among people who had voted for Trump uh, after the election. Um, and you can just see this massive disparity. I mean, you can't even see the trust in media among Trump voters. It literally does not exist behind that black bubble. Um, a very little trust in government or NGOs. But here's what I really want you to pay attention to. The one thing that both sides agree on, which is the trust in business. Right. Yes. Yes. We keep yes. seeing that whether it's, um, you know, across the general population, um, across different dimensions of trust, and even among people who are feeling very disenfranchised and, and not able to rely on other institutions, right, business is sort of this, uh, this bulwark uh, of trust. And when we look, you've been looking at trust for a long time, Tony, and when you see these kinds of results, have you seen these in other societies? For example, you know, you've got societies that traditionally be called more low trust societies or societies with different ethnic groups where some might trust state run media less than others. Like, have you ever seen such a low trust count in other situations that are comparable with the split here and the level of trust that Trump voters have in, in media? Um. I don't know that we often see a number quite as low as that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I really, really don't think we have. I'd have to I'd have to look hard for it. That's, uh, yeah, quite remarkable because you, you, you look at many yeah. countries that have quite low levels of trust there. In I mean, right the now where, you know, one place where there are massive trust challenges uh, socially, for instance, is Japan. You know, they've been ever since the Fukushima disaster, Mm -hmm. um, you could literally see it just literally fell off the chart, um, whether it's trust in government, trust in business, trust in societal leaders. And that was many years ago now. And, and, and the trust levels have not recovered. So that would be the one place that I would go look. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I kind of recover. We will eventually. Let's, let's jump down to the, this privileged position that employers and business find themselves in. And um, we've seen that trust in, in employers is rising um, across um, various countries. And actually, I wanted to jump down to employer um, media, um, which many, uh, I believe many um, respondents described employer media as the most believable. Could you ex explain this uh, table to us, please? Yeah, isn't that remarkable? 
right? So we ask people, how often do you have to see a piece of information from each source before you're likely to believe it? And the most readily believed source of information are communications from my employers, more so than, you know, well-reported media sources or, you know, information from the government, for instance. Um, so this data point, along with a few others that we have um, about, you know, the degree to which uh, people trust employer CEOs, the degree to which they trust their employer as an institution, right? And again, those high levels of trust are true even among groups that are uh, disenfranchised in other ways and distrusting in other ways. So. You know, we've, uh, this data and this report has really gotten us into a lot of very interesting conversations with people about, you know, what does that mean? What, what is employer media, right? And should we perhaps think about what is, you know, about internal communications a little more strategically, right? Rather than as a tactical thing, you know, how do we put the internal communications team at the cool kids table you know, include them a little bit more in the strategy and think about not just how do we leverage um, our ability to influence a workforce that in turn has influence on others, right? As a peer voice, they can be very trusted and very credible, um, but also maybe we can broaden our definition of the workforce to think about not just people who directly work for us as a company, but what about their extended families? What about the broader community, the local community that might think of us um, as a future employer or as a potential employer, as a driver of prosperity in the community, right? Yeah. And suppliers yeah. and, you know, I suppose your brand as it, as it extends further afield. And I've got, I've got one moving right over to the other side of the graph here, Tony, of a personal interest in social media, because uh, it looks like, you know, that people don't necessarily believe something even if they see it a few times in social media. However, social media, in a sense, is a channel, right? And it might be how an employer gets the word out, might be through their, their LinkedIn or a Facebook page or Twitter or other things. And it might be, if you follow the New York Times Facebook page, how you, how you find that more traditional media as well. How do you think about that question? And what do you think people mean when they say, when they reply that they need to see something quite a few times before they'll trust it or might not trust it on social media. Yeah, and in fact, 39% said, I will never believe it if this is the only place I see it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, yes, it's quite a complicated question. I think there's even a question from one of, uh, one of the attendees about this. Um, what is it that people are really thinking about, right? When they're thinking about social media. And, you know, I think the truth is that, um, it, most people uh, have a higher level of awareness right now that there is a lot of misinformation on social media, that it can be very difficult to discern the real source of a piece of information, uh, that it is easy for people to create and share information that is wrong or misleading. Um, they might even dress it up to look like an authoritative source, right? Mm -hmm. So. This is a real challenge for those of us who are trying to use the channel um, uh, to share reliable information, right? And I think it's very important for anyone in the communications field who's using social media as a channel to think about how do I create markers of credibility around my content? You know, how do I make sure that uh, perhaps social is where I'm sharing and distributing the content, but it's easy for people to come back and see the source, to see how the information was put together, you know, and, and I'm providing transparency around the, the, you know, was this a sponsored post, you know, or, or it, you know, what is our motive behind sharing this content, right? And here's where you can go to do more digging and get more information if you need to see it in more places than just on Facebook, to believe yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So it's the mere Facebook post is not the media. It's a means of delivery and bring people to owned channels, most likely a lot of the time, right? Where Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. If we jump up to the news organizations um, bias slide, this is this is the one that that, that really caught my attention. We, we work with a great many news organizations and we're really proud of support and the work we do in the industry there. 
And um, I think as we move right to left with the statements and the percentage of the public that agree with the statements, on the right, I think is a pretty perhaps uncontroversial statement for the media sphere in 2020, 2021. The media is not doing well at being objective and nonpartisan. And I don't think that would raise an eyebrow at all. And it implies, you know, perhaps the degree of audience capture or narrative bias that a lot of publications have adopted in recent years. Um, or maybe that was always there. But as you move across to the left, we see a statement journalists and reporters are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things that are false or a gross exaggeration. So that's less, we've got a bit of bias in which stories we select or how we report them. This is like conscious, we're not telling the truth here. And it's almost the same number. Yeah. So can you tell us, was this the first year you've asked these questions? And can you tell yes. us why you, why you asked these questions? So uh, yes, it's the first year we've asked. So I, I can't give you uh, context, historical context. Um, for those who might be journalists and reporters, just to make you feel a little bit better about that statistic on the left, we asked a similar question about government leaders and business leaders, right? Uh, purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know are false or gross exaggerations. And the numbers for business and government leaders were in the same range as they are for journalists. So it's not only journalists, right? There is a real uh, suspicion of societal leaders in general. And this is what I meant when I said at the top that it's no longer just fake news for foreign countries. Like we think that domestically, uh, and, and this is also not just in the US, we're seeing it around the world, right? That societal leaders are trying to mislead us. But yeah, there is a real fundamental suspicion of the media when it comes to motives, right? And that's what that middle data point speaks to, right? Most news organizations are more concerned with supporting an ideology or political position than they are with informing the public, right? There are other concerns that we've seen over the years around, um, you know, too, too interested in sensational stories versus really informing us, you know, too interested in the clickbait. Um, not, don't have the resources to do real reporting you know, and really bring me the facts. Um, but I do think that that 56% is a bit of a wake up call, right? That we have to really think about as journalists and for those of us who, who provide information, I think again, let's get back to making sure people understand what our motivations are, right? And what, you know, what we're, why, how we are making choices about what we're reporting on and how we're framing those stories very important. I think it's, it's, it's fascinating to think that we're hearkening back to the dear old days when we were worried about sensationalism and media funding. And now we're worrying about the majority of the public viewing media as, you know, as kind of propaganda for a particular perspective. So it's, it's quite a, it's not going the right way so far. Very sobering, yeah. And um, if we were to jump down to the information literacy slide, this is very interesting. You've ask people about their priorities for the year ahead. Can you tell us about these findings, Sonia? Um, yeah, so one of the things we're trying to understand right now is, um, at, along with a lot of other people, right? There've been so many societal changes, uh, fallout from the pandemic primarily, right? The, the social changes, the economic changes. So, so what, which of those are gonna be long-term, you know, and which are sort of short-term changes? And across the research, we're seeing a big increase in the importance, of course, of you know, my family, my health, my personal needs. Uh, but then in the US, look at the other things that rise to the top, right? So which of these in the last year have become more important, which have become less important? We subtract the two, get a net. Mm -hmm. And um, aside from taking care of my family, it's really about civic engagement and engagement with information. Right. And I think people are realizing that, OK, if I can't just trust what I hear from the news or what I hear from business and government leaders or even public health officials, I'm going to have to figure it out myself. Right. Mm -hmm. I need to sort be able to sort through what is true and what is not true when it comes to the news. And even when it comes to what, it, you know, the science of the vaccine, for instance, or, you mm -hmm. know, the, the virus and public health measures. Um, so I, I think it's also fascinating to me 
that there is a parallel rise in engagement with information and engagement with political and civic issues, right? Yeah. Becoming more vocal, both uh, politically, but also at work, as I, I think we might get to later if we have time, you know, in the workplace and, and increase in workplace activism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And scientific literacy is a fascinating one as well. Like, I suppose when major issues of major scientific and public health import have been so politicized as well, everyone is second guessing many of their sources and feeling like you've got to right. go and fend for yourself in this new environment and probably yes. find your new tribe of the people who you who will act as your filters because it's very hard to validate everything. Um, there's, I suppose, a, a related slide. So people want to become um, more media literate and are they, are they doing so? Yeah, this is a, a first time we looked at this as well as part of our digging into the, the infodemic as we call it. Uh, we used four criteria to determine whether we were gonna say somebody had good information hygiene, or good, you know, good practices, personal practices around how they consume information. Are they engaged in the news? Are they looking at diverse sources and avoiding the echo chamber? Are they making sure that what they read is true, checking it in multiple sources? And are they not amplifying or sharing information that has not been checked? And are, um, in order to say that you have good information hygiene, you had to meet three of the four criteria. We're not even asking for an A. We'll give you, you know, a C plus is good enough. And yet only 22% of Americans meet that criteria, right? So we have quite a ways to go. Even among those who are sharing news stories, it's about one in four who practice three of the four of those things. So, you know, we're, if we're gonna take things into our own hands or we need to in order to have good information in the system, um, we have a bit of homework to do, and maybe some education. And I see, I see a question from um, Kate um, Hartby coming through. Do you know how people who pay for news feel about news organizations versus people who don't? And you do an informed public split as well sometimes in your methodology. Do, do you know? That, that's a great question. And yes, Paul, uh, we can't answer it directly, Kate, because we, we haven't asked about you know paid versus unpaid news sources, um, but the oversample we do for an audience we call the informed public. Those are people who are um, college educated. They're in the top quartile of income and they over index on consumption of business and public policy information. So you can assume that they're very likely to pay for one or more news sources, right? To be consuming a lot of public policy or business information. They tend to have much higher levels of trust uh, both in institutions and in information sources. That's encouraging. It is yes. that, the, yeah, the more we engage, perhaps the more- but It's a little bit of a chicken and egg, right? Are they more trusting, therefore they see the value of paying for news, yeah. right? Or because they get more quality content as a result of paying, they become more trusting. Yeah. You know, but it is a virtuous cycle. I think you're right that we have to get more people into that cycle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there may be a funny bell curve where when you just consume too much media, you, you end up not trusting anything at the end. Uh, um, That's me on my worst days on my Twitter feed. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, let's let's jump down. There's there's a lot more to the report, and I hope everyone will be coming um, to download it and see all the pieces that we're going to have to skip through. But I did want to talk about what you see as some of the steps for emerging from information bankruptcy. Look, we've talked uh, about a lot of this, uh, so I won't spend time on all of them. Uh, you know, you saw at the top the, the higher levels of trust in business. We really think it's important that business actively participate in the public conversation, right? So we're telling CEOs, you have to get out there. You have to have um, uh, leadership, demonstrate leadership on issues. And that really means action, right? Before you even talk. Um, I think it is uh, so important that second point that you not only talk straight about issues and, and provide you know, reliable information and insights, but also have that empathy be part of the conversation because people are scared. You mm -hmm. know, they are nervous, they are scared, and they want, they need their fears to be at least heard, if not addressed directly. 
um, the commitment to trustworthy content I could talk about all day. And, but then also very importantly, you know, how do we rebuild some of the fabric of society by creating partnerships, right? So when we tell business to lead, it doesn't mean go do it by yourself. It means forge those partnerships and relationships with other institutions, you know, and maybe it's a local government organization, right? Local governments are far more trusted than the federal government right now. You know, maybe it's specific agencies that are working on real programs, right? So what are the issues that are closest to your community, your employees, your stakeholders, right? And how can you make meaningful action happen on those? Brilliant. I think those are, uh, it's nice to, to, to have some positive steps forward that we can be taking um, given how challenging some of those results are. Um, I just stopping the, the sharing of the report there. So um, that's going to conclude for this week. As always, we, we zoom through everything very quickly. I hope this has been insightful for our audience. And um, thanks for engaging uh, with a whole variety of different different questions coming in from different angles there, Tonya. And um, before we go, I wanted to share that we're launching something um, from Newsweek on Monday. We're launching a predictive intelligence newsletter. Um, as probably most of you know, our, our, our tools predict the trajectory of all the major news stories and in fact, all news stories each day. So we're going to be each morning at 10 a.m. Eastern sharing what are going to be the big stories in the hours ahead, and specifically what are going to be big stories in the fields of business, healthcare, and technology trends. So that's a free service, and um, you can sign up directly on this week's newsletter page. Um, and then we're going to be back in, later in March for our next Pulse. We're going to be joined by Brian Peterson, uh, the CIO at MSL. He's going to be talking about MSL stack and about the uh, the role of the informed customer journey and how earned and influence and owned might be eclipsing classic paid um, in the media mix. And I think, I'm sure that's something that Richard Edelman has spoken to before as well, right, Tonya? Uh, Absolutely. The, the One of his favorite topics. <laughs> the new pipes uh, favor the sophisticated and the earned and, and owned. So, um, Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a wonderful conversation, Tony. Thank you. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. And if anyone here has questions, they want to follow up with me personally and directly, feel free to do so. Thanks, Tonya. Okay, and have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Paul. Bye, everyone.